Would you say that we're on a collision course towards catastrophe, or are you still hopeful for the future? Yeah, I, I think we're f***ed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're just in an incremental decline. Civilization has sort of peaked. We're confronted with so many problems now that we have no control over. I mean, in the US, they can't even pass a budget. So expecting them to like prevent nuclear war seems completely absurd. You did this to us, and now you're telling us it's our responsibility? The logical response to that is, what the hell do we need the government for? You know, the most effective way to survive is to have a small tribe that you can depend on. Like, you're, you're never gonna survive on your own well. Like, you're going to suffer, and eventually it, you're gonna fall apart. It's too much to handle. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. This is part two of my conversation with Dr. Bradley Garrett, the author of Bunker, What It Takes to Survive the Apocalypse. In this part of the conversation, we talk about the psychology of surviving in a post-disaster world, whether as a lone wolf, as part of a community, or even in a bunker. So let's get to it. If it were to go down today, what do you think, how would people respond because a part of me thinks that there is this aversion to pain and, and suffering like you're talking about. We want everything, you know, climate control and everything's got to be perfect, right? And uh, then you see some other cultures where every day they're enduring some kind of crisis and they're just used to it. You know, like you look what's going on in Gaza right now. People are not tearing themselves limb from limb yet. A lot of the the anarchy depicted in post-apocalyptic fiction that from our perspective we think it's going to be dog eat dog do you think it's going to be a dog eat dog world or do you think it's going to be a cooperative more cooperative than people think and we're talking about like a national like you know if the worst were to happen like a nationwide disaster based on your uh the people that you've met and the things that you've seen do you think we're going to cooperate or are we going to compete? Uh, another great question. I've, I, um, you know, there's that old prepper adage, 72 hours to animal. I don't think it holds. Uh, and there's some, some great research that was done by Rebecca Solnit for her book, A Paradise Built in Hell, where she went to places where there were terrible disasters and talk to people about, you know, what happened post disaster. So she goes to um, New Orleans after Katrina and she talks to people and inevitably in every disaster, everyone says people are altruistic. They help, you know, they come together. There's a limit to that. Um, I think it, it starts to get stressed, you know, in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, depending on the circumstances. It also starts to get stressed when you start suffering or your family starts suffering because you're helping other people, right? That becomes a breaking point. But our natural inclination as humans is to help others, which, you know, it, it that seems to run con run contrary to what we, what we think. Um, you know, everyone has this expectation that everyone's going to turn on each other. And I think that that's, I think that's a myth. Okay. I think people will cooperate until they can't anymore. So, but one of the, one of the big lessons in this regard is, um, know your neighbors, <laughs> build a community, like have, have a network of people that you can rely on, that you can trust. And that's something that a lot of preppers, you know, when preppers were called survivalists, right. And they had this kind of lone wolf attitude or model, right. uh, you know, they got that wrong. Like you're, you're never going to survive on your own well like you're going to suffer and eventually it you're going to fall apart it's too much to handle uh for one person or or even just a single family unit like you really need to be able to have uh people that you can depend on and you know even better if you can start building a um a mutual assistance group now where people have complementary skills so it's like okay you know you're you know how to purify water <laughs> i know how to bake bread you know this person over here knows how to how to rig up a solar panel to an inverter and and get some power going um you know if if you can if you can build that kind of network i think that maximizes your your potential for survivability it also means that um th that you're practicing these things 
right? Because because you'll have a network that's encouraging you to be like, well, you know, if it if it ever gets to the point where we need the skill and it's and it's like a survival situation, I need to know now that you can do that. So mm-hmm. let's all work on it together. It seems like most people start off at that level of survivalist and they ultimately become farmers. Yeah. Like I'm sensing that myself too, is that the inevitable conclusion of this is you become a farmer and you are part of a small community. Um, I'm still reluctant though to buy into the idea that in our society, it is going to be as, I agree with you. Like, I mean, if there was a disaster right now, everybody would be out there, you know, on the phone, getting emergency services, doing what they can, right? But I think, I don't know if we've ever been tested for a nationwide, like uh, like a big scale disaster. I, I wonder, especially in our, because we have a lone wolf society. I mean, we're all compartmentalized into our various condominiums and apartments and uh, it's a different society than the one in Gaza where people are accustomed to suffering. They're accustomed to having to dig people out of the rubble. I mean, their immediate reaction isn't an aversion to, you know, it's it's to, to help, like you're saying, the altruistic motivation. And I think you see that pretty much everywhere, so long as people know that help is on the way, right? right. So long as people know <laughs> that okay, this is a regional disaster and not a nationwide one. But what happens if the emergency broadcast system goes off? Does that human behavior change then, I guess is the question. Because I think that we have a very unique set of circumstances and maybe you you know, you know, differ in this perspective that we have a lot of people who are self-medicating. We have a lot of people who are probably disproportionate amount of people on psychopharmaceuticals here in the West who are dependent on that to maintain some equilibrium and be able to function in this crazy world. And we have a dependency on technology that is typically much greater than in a lot of these other more collectivist societies. I worry that, I should say worry, it's not like I'm staying up all night. I'm thinking about that. But, uh, I I am concerned that the outcome in a nationwide, we may get that dog eat dog, but maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're off the mark. Do you think that in a nationwide disaster, the results, the outcome would be the same? I think your point about the framing of time is, is really important, you know? So there were a bunch of studies that were done during the cold war where, cause they wanted to know like, if there were to be a nuclear attack and you put a whole bunch of random people in a bunker together, do they kill each other in the bunker? Like how long, how long can they last in there? Um, You know, because designing the bunker is, uh, you know, your first challenge is technical. It's an engineering challenge. It's a construction challenge. But then once the thing is built, it's pretty much a social challenge, right? Like, can you get people to get along and do you need to have some sort of, you know, authoritarian system of top down order to, to keep order in that bunker or what? So they did these studies, um, where they would put, you know, a couple hundred people in a bunker for 14 days Hmm. and that, you know, that would be the time at which, uh, uh, in a nuclear fallout situation, the radiation levels would drop to the point that you could leave the bunker relatively safely. Right. Yeah. Um, and it worked fine. You know, people went down, they cooperated, uh, they might've had a bit of friction, but it gets solved, you know, and they make it through. But the problem with all of those studies is they knew they were coming out of the bunker in 14 days. Right. 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 So, there um, was certainty there was, yeah, there was some sort of certainty around time. So, you know, let's go back to COVID again. Part of the reason that people started going nuts is because they they didn't know what was going on and how long it was going to last. Like first, first it was week, then it was months, then it was years. And people started cracking, you know, like, when does this end? How long do we have to keep doing this stuff? You know, how long do our lives have to be upended? So I think that question of time is, is really important. And, um, I started thinking, as I was writing this book, I was, you know, like going to people's bunkers and looking at all of their, their supplies and talking to them about their plans. And the thing that kept occurring, reoccurring to me was that they always talked about time, right? It was like, Oh, I'm, you know, I've got three months of food and water. Um, uh, I can, you know, I can stay in this bunker for a year or three or five, you know, the, the most elaborate bunker 
that I went to, he said he could, he could stay down there for five years with 60 people. Right. I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, okay. Five years, but there's, uh, there was always a time attached to it. It's like, you have to have an end point. Otherwise people go nuts. Um, so I think that, you know, it makes sense to think about the bunker in those terms, you know, what is the period of time that you're willing (laughs) to stay down there? Or what is the, the period of time that you're, that you think you can hold people together, uh, whether it's your family or a larger community and sort of, you know, aim for that. Um, but you know, there, there's going to be a threshold in every situation where you can't hold it together anymore. And people are maybe going to turn on each other, uh, you know, that's, that's a different kind of preparation, right? <laughs> yeah. Those, those bunker studies are, are really, um, they're great because there's something you reference in there called Dunbar's number, which is a certain number of people that can kind of cohabitate with minimal amounts of tension within the group. Uh, that's like 150 people. Yeah, it's, the- it's minimal tension and and maximizing cooperation. And the important thing is having like a small enough amount of people that everyone knows each other. Yeah, that's how you keep social cohesion. Of course, you know, modern society has like totally blown past this. You know, we live right. in, we live in huge societies now with millions of people in don't many countries. Know we don't know anyone. Yeah, and that causes that atomization. Um, so you know, the most effective. Uh, way to survive is to have a small tribe that you can depend on. That's that's what Dun- Dunbar's number is pointing to. It's almost as if, perhaps, if something you know were to happen, that it, there'd be this cascading effect that could go in one way or the other. It seems like it could get wildly out of control in one way. Like if people started looting and stuff like that, you could see things maybe quickly start to unravel. But then on the other hand depending on what the launch off point was, if everybody was, you know, started working together initially, like it, it almost seems like the, the, uh, the initial reaction could shape the outcome in a lot of ways, hmm. because I think in a lot of major cities, you'd probably have, yeah, you'd have people taking advantage of the situation maybe. And, um, so I guess the, it would really depend on what people's perception is like you say, the uncertainty of it all in a, have you seen the movie Leave the World Behind? Leave the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in that movie, they try to depict the uncertainty aspect of like a large scale cyber attack. And so you don't know what, and there's all this confusion because everybody's getting different messages sent to their phone about, well, it's the North Koreans, it's the, and then this triggers infighting and civil unrest and you don't know who to trust. And in a situation like that, I think the, you know, we might see the other side of humanity, but uh, I'm hoping we see a more cooperative, I, th- I think maybe in smaller communities, you'll definitely get that. Like you say, where you know people, right? Well, th- I mean, that that was a powerful film because it, it, it pinpoints this sort of dread that we are all experiencing now, like this uncertainty about the world, right? And the more uh, misinformation we're fed, the more we're unsure about what's going on out there in the bigger world the more that dread sort of like builds up, you know, and then it, it starts, it's, it's toxic, you know, it starts making you distrust people. And the easiest way to diffuse that is just to ignore it all. And like, yeah, actually go meet your neighbors, you know, have conversations with real people, build real social connections. Like that is the best buffer against the collapse of society. That's great. That's a good uh, soundbite. <laughs> meet your neighbors. Meet your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you you talked about different types of preppers that you came across. Uh, how would you categorize the different types of preppers that you that you met? I think you had different um, terms that you used to describe the different groups. Yeah, I. You know, obviously, every everyone loves hearing about the the, the elaborate bunkers. You know, right. Um, and so you kind of you know with the bunker, the bunker builders. Uh, often they're ex-military or they worked for the government. You know, there's a there's a lot of um, focus put on offense and defense. Um, and then it kind of feels to me like on the other side of the spectrum, uh, you know, you've got 
the homestead preppers that are like, we need to learn growing seasons above we, ground we preppers. Above ground preppers, yeah. We need to yeah. grow our own food. We need to know our neighbors. We need to, you know, build a collective ranch or whatever. Um, and then you, you know, you do still have the the lone wolves, right? That are like. I'm going to go buy a bunker from Atlas or rising S and I'm going to dig up my backyard and I'm going to put it in there and maybe I'm going to do it in the middle of the night and then, you know, put up a fake sign for a, a grass reseeding or something. How did you know so, my your <laughs> <laughs> so there was, there was actually one of the stories in the book um, is uh, I went to, I think it was rising S and a client hired them to put a bunker in their backyard, but they didn't want their neighbors to know. Mm -hmm. And so they, they sent them a, a message saying that they had won a, a trip. I don't yeah. know. It was like, a, like on a cruise or something, but the neighbors had actually just paid for it. And right. so they went away on the trip thinking that they'd won the sweepstakes or whatever. And while they were gone, they buried the bunker in the backyard, <laughs> Wow, <laughs> which is a pretty elaborate That's plan. Hardcore. But yeah. So, I mean, you still, you still have a lot of that going on. Um, what I wish I'd written more about, actually, I've been I've been watching a lot of Alone. I'm like obsessed with this show now, mm -hmm. and I wish I had done a chapter on bushcraft. If I if I did an update to the book, um, I would probably add that in there. But yeah, so it's good, you know that's that was the whole goal was to try and get this sort of you know broad spectrum, and I and I wanted uh, I wanted women in there, I wanted men in there, I wanted people from different religious and cultural backgrounds, I wanted people living in different countries. Um, so, you know, that was, that was the goal. Uh, and I did find that there were, um, you know, even though there are, there are differences in the way, uh, that people prep, um, that shared methodology was really important. You know, people all over the world are sharing the same information about what's working and what isn't. Um, and you would see that playing out on the ground. And that was always really fascinating. I, it was also really fascinating to see people in communities who had drastically different beliefs. Um, and in normal circumstances, these people would not speak to each other, <laughs> you know, in, in our current partisan political climate. And yet here they were like, you know, putting in a wood burning stove and built and, you know, installing solar panels and getting along perfectly fine because they were focusing on something practical. I think there was a, there was a, a really important lesson there. Hmm. Um, well, that's interesting. Cause I've always thought that when you look at shows like The Walking Dead or something, I know it's fiction, but your central preoccupation in a situation like that is survival. And politics becomes like a luxury at that yeah, point. It's, irre it's irrelevant. Yeah. So do you notice, uh, how do you think the left-right paradigm maps on to preparedness then when you're talking about the, the hole-in-the-ground preppers to the above-ground preppers how do you think in your experience all that plays out? Are you seeing more leftist sort of preppers? Because I, I, I've noticed that, that the, and it's something I actually predicted, you know, when Trump was elected, I, I suspected that you're going to see a lot more people on the left starting to prep now <laughs> for obvious reasons. But uh, so how, how, what is your perception of how the left right paradigm plays into this preparedness thing and, and maybe just, elaborate a bit on what we were talking about with respect to how it, it kind of dissipates when it's a survival situation. There's no, like survival is colorless. It's, uh, you know, there's, it's just about getting what you need to survive. And you realize all these other differences are just luxuries that we can debate about these things. And well, it's, you know, you do have to have an affluent society to be worried about those things, sure. you know? And you so you have to be not in disaster to prepare for disaster. Right. right. And so, yeah. so we can see that as, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, a, a ray of optimism there that like, we're actually doing pretty well as a society. If we, if we have time to worry about all this other crap, you know, True. um, but allowing ourselves to become fixated on it is, is, um, part of the problem. Uh, in terms of the the political spectrum, when I started writing the book, obviously I had like the traditional thinking about it as like left is over here and right is over here, like it's a like it's a linear <laughs> um, uh, trajectory. But actually, the more I spent time with people, I found that it's more like a circle. Like people on the hard right would say exactly the same things that people on the hard left were saying, like distrust of the government, beliefs in conspiracy theories, you know not wanting to be part of society, 
Like, I don't want to pay my taxes. I don't want the government in my business. Like you would, you know, you would hear that narrative from people on, on the hard ends of that political spectrum. So they would end up weirdly cooperating in some of these communities. Like you'd have someone out there trying to build an eco house with like, you know, tires or hay bales or whatever. And then someone out there building a bunker and they're all cooperating in the same community. Um, that was really fascinating, but you know, most people weren't there. They were, they were, you know, somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. And, um, the other thing that, that was kind of interesting was that, you know, I had an expectation, uh, that I was going to be running into like white fat middle-class men, <laughs> right. That were going to be building this stuff. In and BDUs, of course I was just told, military fatigues and, uh, completely. Uh, yeah. And I, and that was just blown out of the water, like immediately, um, I started running into, uh, people that were living in cities and they were prepping and they had really small spaces and they're, you know, working in the tech sector or whatever, but they're like stuffing stuff under their beds and, you know, filling every closet in the house. Um, we saw, a, a dramatic upshot in millennials prepping after COVID. Um, I think the, the last statistic that I saw from the United States was, um, that 56% of millennials said that they had, they had purchased emergency supplies. Fascinating. Right. Yeah. So that, that's not, I wasn't expecting that. Um, we're getting old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, it's, it's not the, um, it's not the monolithic culture that, that people think it is, or maybe that it once was, you know, perhaps if I had written this book 10 years ago, it would have a very different shape. Um, but I did find a, a pretty diverse and interesting community out there. Like, you know, like, like we discussed, there were a lot of people on the fringes, but most people were um, pretty practical in the way that they approached it and were, weren't, uh, didn't have an aversion in any way to working with someone that they didn't agree with because they have the same goal. Ultimately. It seems like it's a way to bring people together then too, in a way, like the guy built, built the bunker and the guy in the yurt, like there, there's some weird overlap there. It's, you know, the, the fact that you weren't able to put the, the bushcraft element into here is, is too bad because I do think that there's another dimension to the political spectrum with respect to bushcraft to it kind of knows no politic because I know people who are very, you know, can be construed as on the right who like bushcraft and just as many, you know, cause it's a very like hippie sort of pastime to be <laughs> out there in the woods and doing stuff. Right. So there's this interesting, um, it, it seems to bring people together in a lot of ways. Um, even though they're kinds of on these end, on the ends of the spectrum, but you, you had said something in the book with respect to bu building bunkers as an act of civil disobedience and a way to hide from the increasing like surveillance society that it's symbolic of our desire to to retreat from what some people are saying is like a developing totalitarian regime what do you uh, what do you make of that um you know in terms of of i guess what social scientists might call surveillance capitalism, you know, we're kind of moving into this area where, um, you know, we're being watched from space. <laughs> Everything's been mapped. Um, our phones are tracking us. They're in our pockets, right? Like we, our expectation of privacy has gone down exponentially in the past five years in particular. Um, and there's going to be very little to stop that. And so, um, you know, the underground, has always been a space where um, we hide the things that we're scared of, <laughs> where we bury the things that we want to protect, mm -hmm. um, and where we take shelter when when we're scared. Like, I mean, go back to caveman days, right? Cave. Like you went, yeah, <laughs> you, you literally went to the cave yeah. and piled up rocks in front of it because you know you were afraid of what was happening out there. But it's also where you would go to stash your supplies. Right? I don't yeah. want an animal to get these, so I'm going to put them in a jar and put the jar in the cave and block the cave up, and then I can come back for it. It's a cache, right? So um, it seems like, you know, the underground is also becoming a space now where we can cache ourselves. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a, there's a particular kind of 
freedom that's becoming more and more rare when you know that no one's watching you, that no one can watch you. And I experienced this as an urban explorer all the time. You know, I was, I was living in London, a city of 20 million people. And then we would open up a manhole and go into the sewer and close the thing over us. And then we could walk around under the city all night long and no one knew we were there and our phones didn't work and we could spend all night exploring and hanging out with each other. And there was something so, um, uh, I don't know. It it just fe- it felt so human. It's like in a way, you know, your phone is watching you twenty four seven. Like in the back of our minds, we have to realize that you know our phones are listening, possibly recording. You know all the sensors and yeah, like you're saying, there's this maybe that unconsciously you realize, oh, we're free. Yeah. Well, I think that I think that also adds to that sense of dread. Like somebody's watching me all the time. Someone's monitoring what I'm doing constantly. You know, think about like ring cameras drive me nuts. So, you know, uh, (laughs) everyone puts a ring camera on their door. And then as you're moving from point A to B, you're just constantly being filmed by a thousand cameras. It's crazy that as a society, we're okay with that. Oh, sure. We just monitor everything. But then also look at what the government is doing. You know, they've, um, they uh, piloted a program. uh, I think it was in, I think it was in, Ohio, where they put a blimp in the sky that had this really elaborate camera array on it. And the cameras would take photos of the entire city every 20 seconds or yes, whatever. Yes, I'm aware of this. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? McNutt, the guy that, that started this thing. Ex-military, of course. Sounds like a guy yeah. who would start that sort of thing. Yeah, completely. <laughs> that, there, was a, there was a Radio Lab episode about it that was really uh-huh. good. Um, so it takes but, in real time, it's recording everything from space, what's going on in a city. Yeah. I mean, not even from space. This is like a, just a blimp in a the blimp. sky, oh, yeah, blimp, you know? Yeah. So what they could do is like, if a, if a crime was committed, mm-hmm. they could just reverse time and be like, oh, we know that a white van robbed this warehouse and let's just rewind the tape and you follow the van back to the house it came from yeah and then you go to the house and arrest everyone i mean that that's some terrifying minority report stuff you know because what it what it leads to essentially is a pre-crime unit right where you're like uh we know this person keeps moving in these certain ways and their patterns are indicating certain things and you know we're just going to get involved so i all of which is to say i think that's the kind of stuff that makes people feel um uh the sense of like low level anxiety this hum that like i don't know who's watching me but when you get underground it goes away that frequency isn't there yeah, that low hum that you're talking about. It's not there. Dissipates. It's like it's like I used to think about it in London as like a uh, like um an urban wild. You know, it's like be, it's like being off by yourself in a forest where you know no one's there and like you could strip down and go nuts. You can do whatever you want. No one's going to hear you. No one's going to see you. Yeah. If you left your phone at home. But, you know, you can find that in the city, which is a, which is a really cool thing. And I think AI is only going to make it worse with respect to, because that's what's going to connect all the data together. So that you're going to have, uh, right now, it's just kind of scattered bits of data. You got a ring camera here, one over here, and you got your phone here, and, you know, whatever other kinds of surveillance, and, you know, your vacuum cleaner that 3D maps your house. and But eventually there's going to be something that ties it all together completely and is able to, like you're saying, make some sort of minority report predictions of what you're going to do next when your next bowel movement is going to be, you know, what you're, when you're going to get hungry and exactly what you're going to want to eat at that specific time to tailor it. It'll all be for advertising. But, um, I mean, even the data that our, our watches are collecting on us right now. And we have the same watch. We we have the same watch. Yeah. (laughs) And that's how, you know, you're a prepper is when you finally end up with a, a, uh, uh, Garmin watch that has solar power and it also has a GPS capability. So you can have maps on it. Solar power GPS watch. But it's, all, but it's also feeding all of this health data exactly to an algorithm, which eventually AI is going to scrape mm-hmm. and then it's going to start making assumptions. I mean, imagine your, you know, healthcare premium shooting up because your watch is like, you, you don't walk enough. And I can see from your heart rate that you've been drinking 
three days a week and you know what I mean? Yeah. This is where we're headed. So So the bunker is a, a place of, of refuge from that in a way. So you're saying that maybe there's it's not just about preparing for collapse, it's also about preparing for the present. Absolutely. Yeah. One one of the one of the guys that I hung out with a lot, Milton at the X point in South Dakota, this is an amazing facility. So there's, there's 575 concrete bunkers that were built during world war two. And they, where is they, this? This is South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. Right. So these bunkers were built to store munitions so they couldn't be bombed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, you know, after the war, they take all the munitions out and this, this thing's left behind. It's three quarters the size of Manhattan, this bunker field. Yeah. Um, so a property developer in California, Robert Vicino, has this amazing idea. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna lease these things from the government and then sublease them to preppers that are looking for a bunker and build a community. It's an awesome idea. But one of the guys that I that I was hanging out there with, uh, named Milton, he said I told him why do why do you like coming because he kept coming out there like he wanted to live in the bunker yeah so why do you like it so much and he said because when i close the blast door and i hear it doom, that he you know the heavy metal shutting and i and i seal it and my phone stops working i know that i'm alone it's the only time that i'm alone hmm. And I think a lot of people can identify with that, you know, like when are we ever truly alone? We don't feel that very often. So we're looking for that freedom that only comes with not being surveilled by a centralized a power. And that's exactly why governments built those bunkers in the first place. That's why they were secret until right. they get declassified, right? Do you think that there's a, a self-fulfilling component to all of this? with respect to preparing for doom. I think there's a part in the book where you talk about, it's almost as if we've given up, like the, there's a certain uh, capitulation to the inevitable when you build a bunker and you decide to, you know, just kind of shut the door that you're, we, we're past the point of looking for solutions. What are your thoughts on, on that? Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the preppers that I speak to basically say like we're, we're past the threshold, right? Like there's no point in trying to, to mitigate <laughs> what's coming. All, all we have to worry about now is, is adaptation. I don't think these things are mutually exclusive, right? We can be working on trying to solve, you know, some of these global problems that we have. And at the same time, putting preparations in place for ourselves to make sure that if things do go wrong, we're going to be in a better situation than someone else who didn't prepare. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, yeah, I don't think these things are mutually exclusive at all. Okay. I think we should be working on all those problems at once. I mean, it's a lot to, it's lots of hold in our head. What's frustrating for most people, I think, and where the, and where this dread comes from is that we're confronted with so many problems now that we have no control over. Right? And it feels like, we can't steer politicians. We can't steer governments in the direction we need to to get them to solve these things. You know, it's like they can't. I mean, in the U.S., they can't even pass a budget. Right. You know, they can't. They can't even fund the government. You know, so expecting them to like solve climate change or or prevent nuclear war seems completely absurd. Mm -hmm. Like these people are are inept, and I think you know that's where a lot of that frustration comes from. But um, you know, you can you can spend all day worrying about that and you know keeping yourself up at night or you can just accept that that's where we are in the history of human civilization and uh, you know we can try and work on it incrementally to change that and in the meantime be putting our our stockpiles in place in the background to make sure that we're not a victim or or we're not the one that needs to be rescued you know if and when things do go terribly wrong hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, that's another aspect of that altruism, right? Is it, um, and, and a lot of people told me this, I was writing the book, they said, you know, there's a misconception that prepping is selfish, that this is about, you know, I want stuff, I want to keep myself and my family safe, but I don't care about anyone else. And they said, that's, you know, that's not, that's not the case at all. What we're doing is making sure that, you know, when emergency services is deployed, they don't need to rescue me. And in fact, I might be able to rescue, go rescue someone to take even more pressure off of them. Exactly. Right? You take the pressure off the emergency services in a lot of respects. Yeah. And that, you know, that whole mindset goes back to the Cold War because you have to remember, um, 
I mean, well, we don't remember, but you know, there was a, there was a point in time when people were fairly sure that there was going to be a nuclear exchange. Mm -hmm. And some countries took that very seriously and put preparations in place for their citizens. So Switzerland famously has, you know, bunkered space for more than a hundred percent of the population, right? which is wild, right? Like what a crazy infrastructure project. Um, North and South Korea really prepared Israel, you know, I think since uh, 1963 uh, have mandated that you have had to have a bunker inside your house uh, when it's constructed. A mamad, it's called. It's like one room in the house. Um, so the the response in this part of the world <laughs> was very different. So in the U.S., you had um, John F. Kennedy in 1963 giving this speech where he essentially says, um, uh, you know, uh, the conf in the conflict with the Soviet Union, uh, we need to depend on you to make yourselves prepared for, for what may come. I mean, he essentially told Don't people ask what your country can do for you. That's exactly, that was exactly yeah. the line, you know, but, and, and Sears started, they, they were putting out this like, you know, Sears catalog that everyone would get at that time. And they were actually selling bunkers in the Sears catalog and life magazine had this whole spread on like a letter from the president telling you to build a bunker in your backyard. You know, I mean, it's like, what a, what an amazing thing. But, um, what that came down to was that. Do you think we're going back to that? I think we are going back to that. So nuclear planners at the time basically like tried to budget out what it would cost to build the bunkers for, for every citizen. And it was more than the GDP of the entire country for a year. So, so they couldn't afford it. But it also was the moment, I think, when people started losing faith in the government, right? Because like the, the, the fundamental, the primary function of a government is to keep its people safe. Yeah. And essentially what the president was saying is we can't. Yeah. We created this thing, we created this monster, we can't control it, we're not sure what's gonna happen, and please can you take care of yourselves, right? So then the logical response to that is what the hell do we need the government for? You did this to us, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're telling us it's our responsibility to prepare for it? So you can see where that frustration came from that led to that kind of lone wolf survivalism, you know, where people were like, actually, how about I just stop paying taxes and I move into the woods and I do build my bunker and you just leave me alone. Like I want nothing to do with the government anymore because you've abdicated your responsibility to keep me safe. Mm -hmm. You know, that is, um, uh, social scientists talk about that as the first doom boom when people started building all those bunkers. I, I think that we're in the midst of a second doom boom right now. And so people have obviously lost faith in a lot of the institutions, including the media, the government, and that is fueling this uh, mad dash for self-preservation that we're seeing that in some ways seems somewhat self-fulfilling because I think uh, when you're when you're investing in, in preparedness, and we were talking about this earlier today, where th there's a certain uh, validation that comes with disaster because you knew oh i was you know i this is what i was preparing for right and if disaster never comes it's kind of like you feel as though well maybe i'm maybe i'm off the mark maybe this is a waste of time um do you feel that there's an inevitability to the many crises uh, be they the, the prospect of I, I call them like endogenous existential threats things that weren't perhaps present 100 years ago, like the climate issue, the uh, cyber attack component, uh, the climate, uh, uh, you know, the nuclear threats, technologies that, you know, were non-existent 100 years ago that are presenting themselves as actual um, Anthropocene extinction level events that could unfold. What is, if you had to you know, place a bet, would you say that we're, we're on a collision course towards catastrophe or are you still hopeful for the future? <laughs> uh, you're going to, you're going to make me be a pessimist. <laughs> that's, that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Misery loves company. Yeah. As they say. No. Yeah. I, I think we're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, uh, but I don't, I don't believe 
necessarily that there's going to be a massive existential event that's going to you know wipe out 80 percent of humanity or something that's not mm -hmm. that's not really where i'm at i i think that we're just um we're just in an incremental decline that mm -hmm. you know civilization has sort of peaked um and we're we're on the downslide right now um running out of resources uh you know i mean look at look at the the uh um, lake powell in the western u.s is at its lowest level since the dam was since the hoover dam was put up you know and it just keeps dropping and dropping and soon the dam's going to stop working and again it's like we have a government because they're supposed to fix this stuff and they're totally inept they're just not they're not doing it yeah um and then of course the climate crisis you know this uh, as these weather events get more severe more intense more unpredictable it becomes really hard to prepare for and to deal with right um but it also puts people on edge you know so that so that dread that was like bubbling in the background about all these existential level events that could happen starts turning into an anxiety about this is happening, but I don't know how to deal with it or how to stop it or how to change my life to be able to, to uh, negotiate this. So I just, I see things slowly falling apart. You know, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence is another, is another big factor here that, you know, the, the potential social and economic impacts of rolling out AI um, it's just going to cause so much frustration and, and heartbreak and despair, you know, it's like, that's not where you want a civilization to be or a society to be, you know, you want people to be hopeful and optimistic and looking forward to the future, you know? And, um, uh, I think most people aren't there. Weirdly, a lot of preppers are, <laughs> yeah. you know, cause you, cause you talk to people and they're like, why, why would I be putting all this stuff in place if I thought the world was going to end tomorrow? Right. All mm -hmm. I'm trying to do is, is like maximize Weather. my chances of being able to, to maintain my lifestyle, um, and, and maintain my ability to take care of myself and my family. So, you know, that's, there, that's another one of those weird contradictions that you, you would imagine preppers would be like totally paranoid and anxiety ridden. And I actually found them to be, um, uh, m more calm and at peace than a lot of people that haven't put any preparations in place. That seems to be a very uh, prominent view amongst academics in particular, this idea that it's going to be an incremental degradation of our, our living standards. Uh, a friend of mine, Nate Haggins, who's a natural resource uh, expert, and this is his kind of area of expertise, is the coming economic contraction in the energy that uh, he calls it the carbon pulse, like this period of human history, this brief 100 years where we had at our disposal an unlimited amount of fossil fuels to burn. Yeah. And this drove like, you know, wildly high stock markets and GDPs and that that's all coming to an end and that it's going to be this slow burn disaster. Whereas I think there's this fixation in Hollywood with the big event, you know, because there's, there's a certain freedom to the event, right? Because the, the, the dystopian world is almost a more difficult world to navigate than Mad Max when you think about it. Because you have dystopian, you know, the totalitarian government, eye in the sky, and the supply crunch on one hand. And then you have Mad Max, survive the wasteland, full-blown anarchy on the other. So excessive rule of law versus um, without rule of law. I'm sure you came across those terms when you're yeah, course, doing your yeah. research, right? <laughs> so... As preppers, there's almost like this uh, tacit hope that there's a precipitous collapse because it's almost, from some people's perspective, even though I think this is kind of delusional thinking, to think that it's almost easier if it's just that cut and dry. If it's like, okay, now you're on your own, as opposed to have to, you know, tiptoe around the, oh, is there a law being enforced here? Is there not? Is there, you know, like this gray zone of, contraction and calamity but still law and order you know what i mean yeah does that make sense yeah i mean you know if you if you think it would be better to deal with go go turn off your breaker to your house and your water main 
<laughs> and, and try try it out for a couple weeks. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not super fun. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, I find uh, that when I'm when I'm camping, for instance, like your life just becomes totally dominated by logistics. Yeah. Like you're just constantly packing and unpacking and repairing yeah. and finding food and cooking food, and that's all you do. You yeah. know. Time. And, uh, yeah. So the question for me, the energy, is, the, the energy from the grid is saves us so much time like that that oil like Tagans talks about how a barrel of oil is like five years worth of human labor yeah but then what do we do with all of that extra time we squander it sure we squander it worrying about having all these you know petty concerns and whatever i mean that is so frustrating i guess that's the thing that that you know i i hope people would take away from the book is like you don't you don't have to uh, buy into all these narratives you don't have to believe a particular way um but you could be using your free time and your disposable income if you're lucky enough to have a disposable income in a much better way than most people are you know stop squandering time and resources it's just it's not it's not healthy for us it's not healthy for the planet um there, there are better ways to be using our resources and and uh you don't have to build a bunker but you know try fixing things in your house like get into diy you know try build build your build your bug out vehicle that you get to enjoy with your family to go camping in mm -hmm. you know but then also doubles as a kind of security blanket yeah you bunker know. on wheels as you say yeah the mobile bunker yeah i call it <laughs> you talk about the bunker as a as a chrysalis mm. it's one of the things that st stood out to me in one of the chapters of your book bunker as a chrysalis what do you mean by that I just, well, so this is exactly what you were talking about that, um, you know, people have this imagination that the, that, um, the world is going to be better after an event potentially. Mm -hmm. Um, and the bunker plays a key role in that because it's like you, you go into this bunker and you, you're filled with anxiety and social expectations and work obligations and family stressors and all of that stuff. Right. But then you, you go inside and your, and your world becomes really small and manageable. And, and some people told me that they saw that as an opportunity for self transformation. Like they imagined themselves becoming a better version of themselves once they were disconnected from everything else. And so when they emerge from the bunker into potentially the post-apocalyptic world, right mm -hmm. they imagine a better version of themselves coming out of the bunker right. so um i f i found that really fascinating and obviously there's there's um you can pick all sorts of holes in their logic there um but i do like the idea that the bunker can be a place where not just not just a place where you get to disconnect right mm -hmm. but also a place where you can improve yourself and improve, reset, and improve your situation and reset. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Well, there's a certain stripping of our neuroses that occurs after, you know, everything that society expects a lot of people in terms of maintaining a job and you got to go and you got to put your work face on and you got to, you know, and I think there's a lot of people in the absence of that, maybe they would be different maybe they would be their personalities would be slightly different or and maybe there's this hope for you know a reset so that they can be free from all of this stuff right all these distractions and these obligations these micro obligations that we have these contracts social contracts and i think there's a there's a certain overwhelm with all that that's that's happening where people want to revert to that simpler lifestyle. I mean, even just the idea of going camping in itself, why would a person do that? I mean, you got to go, you got to, you could go from a nice climate controlled place and a nice warm bed where you have a fridge, you have running water. What rational person, and why do I, like myself, I go camping all the time, why do I will, willingly <laughs> put myself in that situation where I got to suffer? And I think the answer is, is because there's there's something about it that, um, like you say, it's it's revitalizing. It's you know it it shows you uh, you can be the I guess it just reminds you of of you know like being alive and uh, wanting to feel alive. And in order to feel alive, you have to struggle a little bit. 
be in your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, philosophers talk about that as phenomenological experience, right? This kind of like direct experience that we have in the world. And most of modern technology, the whole point is to take us out of the world to distract us, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, look at, look at all of the, um, this huge rise in post-apocalyptic video games and films, like, you know, people are sort of playing out the thing that they secretly want to do in real life. Like they want to have this, this visceral connection to the world to huh. have, to have this, you know, to dive into it, to, to be practical to be self-sufficient right yeah. and instead <laughs> they go play a game where you're you're doing those things virtually right right um i think i think that there's something i mean you know you've got a background in psychology there's something really interesting there because it's i think th they just need to step over that line where they're like instead of playing this or watching this i'm gonna do it yeah and once people do it they realize that there's um that you know, not just is it is it a, a sort of a break from everyday life that does recharge your batteries a little bit, even if you suffer through the mm -hmm. process. I can tell you about a horrible camping trip I went on a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> four day oh. backpacking trip that went all wrong. Um, but uh, but the other thing is that while you're in that situation, you're utilizing practical skills that we've used for hundreds of thousands of years as human beings, right? So it comes naturally. It comes, it comes naturally, but then it, it also makes you, I don't know, it gives you, it gives you a connection to the past and to other people mm. to make a fire, to cook food, to walk to a place, you know, uh, to explore, to discover. And so we're, we're increasingly, you know, as Baudrillard wrote, living in this world of simulation and simulacra, where we're replacing those experiences with a virtual simulation of those experiences. Right. And it's fundamentally survival video games. Yeah. And it's unsatisfying. Right. right. It's unsatisfying. Watching alone is not the same as building a bushcraft shelter. Right. <laughs> go, go try and do it, you know, but I mean, you can watch it and you can gather information. It's, it's useful for that. And I, I watch these shows and movies. I play these games too. Yeah. And it's great to be able to um, watch them and sort of like t take away information, but then I want to go apply it because I know that that's where the reward comes in. So with respect to this, this fantasy about the apocalypse, what do you think that's about? Why do you think people play these video games and obsess about these movies? And, and why is there this new cultural interest in apocalypticism? Hmm. Um, I, my personal view on this is that, is that I think people feel more... Uh, f people feel like they have no control over their lives anymore, <laughs> right? Like you, you go to work, you're told what to do. You come home, you're, you're a slave to your phone, right? You've got, you're constantly connected, constantly having to text people, call people. You're, I mean, you're, we're just on all the time. And so I think that there's a kind of fantasy that plays out that where we would be disconnected mm. and where no one would expect anything of us where the only expectations we have are of ourselves. I think that's, that's part of the fantasy of the, of the post-apocalyptic world. Or, I mean, it's also, it's a similar fantasy um, that people have about sort of, I don't know, disappearing into the wilderness or whatever. Did you ever read um, A Stranger in the Woods? Can't say I have, no. Oh my God, it's an amazing book about this guy in Maine who dis who disappeared into the woods? He he left. Oh, he left. Yeah, his, I know. Yeah, he left. We did a video on that guy. Oh, did you? Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what a story, he, right? For like twenty years. For twenty years, he did, yeah, yeah. he did, he just wandered out into the woods, and then but Remember then yeah. you find that the only way that he survived was by looting other people's houses, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And it kind of like pops the bubble. You're like, oh man, I thought yeah. you know, like. Yeah, he wasn't out there lighting fires and you know living like a caveman. He was he was living off the you know, the leavings of society. Yeah. I actually, after I read that book, I tried it. Um, there, I was living in England and there's, okay. a, there's a, a place there called center parks. Do you know that? It's like a, it's like a water park family resort, but it's like in the middle of a forest and it's all sort of like barbed wire and you know, like, it's like a, it's like a, like a fantasy fortress. <laughs> okay. And, um, and I just, I read that book and I was like, can you do that? You know, could I just move into the forest and like, build a bush shelter 
and sneak into the park every day and eat people's leftover food and have a shower there. And I, and I did it for like two weeks and it worked fine. Wow. Isn't that weird though? You know, we live in this, in this point in society where there's so much excess that you can just live off of other people's excess. Mm -hmm. I mean, they call it being a hobo, I think. Yeah. That's that's basically the life they leave, right? Some some people like that life. But I was like, I was taking a shower every day and going to the gym and going to water slides and drinking margaritas that people left on their table. Like I was having a pretty, a pretty plush existence. You know, I definitely didn't feel like a hobo. Wow. It was fun. That sounds like uh, something I'll have to try if this doesn't go well. (laughs) If, if I get canceled, I know there's, <laughs> <laughs> you can always just go, yeah, yeah. Live, live outside of Disneyland and yeah. sneak in every just day. Hide in the bush. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to see, seeing where your, your pursuits take you in the future. Is there any other, um, anything we missed in terms of, I mean, I'm sure there's all kinds of specific bunkers and stuff that you visited i would just encourage people to go and check out the book because it it does go into great depth uh probably more than we can go into here today and again if you want to learn about preparedness culture if you want to know everything there is for a civilian to know about the underground world then uh definitely go and check out this book but thanks a lot for coming out and where where else can people get more information about what you what you do uh my website's bradleygarrett.com uh and on most social media you can find me at goblin merchant so uh most active on instagram but um yeah i kind of abandon x yeah <laughs> formerly known as twitter i don't know okay. i just well, it got too weird <laughs> kind of kind of you know, still kinda on it, ship so. on that but yeah. but i don't know you're inspiring me to to get back on get back on youtube i think maybe that's maybe I that's think it'd the be right great move. to share your adventures i mean you got a lot of information i know my viewers would love to see you know some of the the visuals that go along with these stories oh, and, i've got um, i've got so much amazing like drone footage from these facilities that i've never done anything with i mean yeah it's yeah. definitely I should dig through the archives and well if you start a youtube channel between now and the time of posting this video we'll make sure that we link it in the description below and we will put it on the screen right here awesome so. sounds good but thanks a lot for coming out man okay. greatly appreciate it's it it's been an absolute pleasure awesome super fun cool the best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at canadianpreparedness.com where you'll find high quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk and no gimmicks. Use discount code prepping gear for 10% off. Don't forget the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.